Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm honored to be here to kick off your conference. And thank you to Anisha for inviting me to talk. Um, so you may be wondering why I'm doing this talk as someone who is traditionally trained to deliver anesthesia and six needles into people. So I've always been fascinated with this idea of how to optimize the human body, both on a personal level and a professional level. And the latter has really come after working with patients over a decade. And so a few things that have come out of being in the hospital for years are, number one, I think it makes a lot more sense to prevent trouble than to chase it. And this shows up in the OR daily and also shows up in our pain clinic. In clinic, we are routinely seeing a subset of patients who have conditions that are beyond the point of recovery. And on the other hand, we have a subset of patients who come in after many birthdays and they're extremely functional. And so this always begs the question in my head, um, you know, what could we have done differently for the patients that are coming in that have issues that we can't fix? And similarly, what are those other patients doing that are keeping them highly functional at a later age? Um, and the other, the other thing I wanted to say is that the good thing that's come out of the pandemic is that it's caused people to really reconsider their own health and recalibrate on what's important. And it's not just our genetics that are creating most of our health, it's really our epigenetics. And that's the way that our behavior and environment change the way our genes work. And there's also this idea of the exposome, and that's how our health is constantly being influenced by our environment. So different carcinogens, different um, biological agents like viruses, bacteria, and even our own social relationships. So between all of this, there's this common thread is how do we take care of ourselves in an effective manner? So it's hard to talk about integrated medicine and pain management in such a short amount of time and also make it personalized to each of you who likely have different needs and different questions. And coming from a really interventional field, I always feel like we have these fancy procedures and all this sort of unnecessary pharmacology in our toolbox, but what we're really missing is how to discuss the art of living in our day-to-day -day life. And that's just that's more than just, you know, exercise more, eat less. And so my practice really encompasses the above. And today we're going to focus on the last one, which is lifestyle. And I don't think, oh, sorry. Okay, I don't think the laser pointer is working, but we're going to focus on, on lifestyle. And I wanted to make one other point is that I think we're always chasing data in medicine. And I really do think there's a power in N equals one because each person has a unique set of genetics overlaid with their different environmental factors. So there aren't always set protocols on how everyone should be doing everything. So the Institute of Lifestyle Medicine has a great framework for how to think through things. And basically, it's changing our lifestyle really changes our epigenome in real time. And our body has its own innate healing system, that it, and it wants to work for us. We just need to give it the right tools. And by making those positive lifestyle changes, which are the pillars that are listed above, we can really reduce the risk of developing chronic disease. And when we use these really intensively, we can actually treat and reverse these conditions. And studies have actually shown that these pillars that are listed up here are much more potent at prolonging lifespan and health span than a lot of our drugs that are available. So lifespan is the number of years that you live, and health span is the years you live that are healthy without anything chronic or debilitating. So intuitively, we understand what that means, but let's look at this graphically. So here we have our X and our Y axis. So lifespan is how long you live, right? Health span is how well you live, so on this side here. And so that means cognitively, emotionally, and physically. So for the average person in this country, that curve crosses at 80. Um, sorry guys, this, the pointer's not working. So that's the day you're no longer living. On the y-axis, these are your quality of life elements and they begin to decline until the curve crosses the x-axis. So a perfect longevity square would be, it would go straight across and then drop down the day that you die. So next we can say that this curve peaks around 40. And you hit 50% of your peak health span at around 70, and the rest of the 50% decline happens in the last decade. So the rate of change higher up on that curve, if you remember, go back to calculus, 
it's, it's very small, and as we go down the curve, the rate becomes more precipitous. And a lot of you may have appreciated that with having you know, aging parents or some, someone aging in your life. And so the question then becomes is how do we make that curve better? Um, can you guys scroll down? I'm, yeah, okay. So the first thing that we see, so to make this curve better, you go from the green to the red. So the first thing you see is that first, the first red arrow that I put up there, you drive more lifespan. So let me step back for a second here. So to make this curve better, you round it out. So you go from the green to the red. And so that shows us a few different things. So the first thing is that you live a little bit longer. We don't really know what that delta might be. It may be 10 years, it may be 15 years. And it doesn't really matter because we're looking at how to live a good health span. The second thing that you see is that we delay the decline in our health span in our middle years. And so that's that arrow right there. You see that it, we've slowed that decline. And the third thing that you'll see is that we've compressed this period of morbidity. And we spend a lot of resources extending chronic disease in the last decade of people's life. And so the idea is, is how can we spend a smaller amount of time in this area? So how can we compress our morbidity? So how do we do this? In its most distilled form, it's really about preserving three elements of life, your brain, body, and your spirit. The last one, the spirit, doesn't necessarily fit this curve in the sense that it doesn't have the same downward pressure that the brain and the body do. So these metrics help you think about how to have a better overall quality of life. It's, it's not an absolute, it's just a way for you to think about it. And we know that there's merit to this idea when we look at the blue zones across the world. And these are areas that are known to have the highest concentrations of centenarians living, or people that reach 100. And so blue zones do a lot to keep their ep epigenome alive and healthy. And keep in mind, these people are still often dying of the same diseases that we are, but they're able to do it much later and much faster. That's where that compressing the morbidity comes in. So we wanna understand what they're, they're doing. What are those ingredients for health? Is it real food, the right amount of nutrients, rest, connection, light, air, movement, purpose? And just, I wanna make a note here that this isn't about some hedonistic pursuit to longevity. It's really about creating a society that feels good and can show up and collaborate and connect with the people and things that matter to them. So there's new research that's emerging around the hallmarks of aging and understanding why these hallmarks become dysfunctional, what deranges them and how we can optimize that matrix. And so one of those hallmarks is nutrient sensing. And without getting too complicated, suffice it to say that food is information, it's code for what our body does. And so a great place to start and make a few points is um, based on what we know from the literature. So if we look at over 1 billion years of evolution, which ends up being in non-humans because it's really hard to do longevity research just in humans, um, and we look at the interventions that have uniformly extended life and therefore reduced disease, there are a few things that are gonna stand out from this body of science. And the first is a signaling environment that mimics one in which our insulin, our insulin-like growth factor, and mTOR, which is a protein that we won't get into that helps our body get into autophagy, which is a process by which we can get rid of bad cells in our body. So having low amounts of those drives longevity and decreases disease. And thus, signaling that environment has become the interest of a lot of pharmaceutical drugs. And the second is that there's something going on with calorie restric restriction that confers longevity and decreases aging, healthy aging. So one of the big landmark studies done it's actually been done on laboratory mice and um, uh, monkeys, uh, show that when caloric restriction was restricted by 50% while still maintaining nutritional requirements, their lifespan was doubled. And this study has been replicated since then. So we know that there's something going on here that matters. And it's interesting to note that if you look at this idea of fasting, which has now become a popular fairly popular term here in the West. It's actually existed for centuries as a cleansing tool. And if you look back at all major religions, fasting has been cited in some way in, in everyone's scriptures. 
So the first thing we're gonna talk about is nutrition and how to mimic this idea of calorie restriction. And this is a complicated topic because different things work for different people based on their weight, their muscle mass, you know, what medical conditions they're dealing with. And so one way to break it down, which I think makes sense and easier to understand, is to classify eating into three different levers. So caloric restriction, how much you eat, dietary restriction, what you eat or don't eat, whether it's proteins, fats, sugars, and time restriction, when you eat and don't eat, also known as intermittent fasting. And so all the diets that we talk about, paleo, vegan, keto, if you think about it, they somehow fit into one of these three levers. And so a tactic that I think makes sense then is to think about pulling any one of these levers at a given time, whether you're delaying your feeding window, being more thoughtful about what you eat, or restricting the total amount. And depending on what your goals are, you could be pulling two levers at a time, and every now and again you pull all three to get a deep cleanse. And so the reason I like this viewpoint is it's fairly agnostic, it doesn't stick to any particular diet, and it also sticks to this overall idea of maintaining a certain homeostasis in your body, and that, that's really your glucose levels. And if you're giving some thought to that, then you're, you're doing okay, you're doing good. And I always say this, though, if, like one thing's for certain, if you want to be sick, eat as much as you want, whenever you want, of whatever you want. And that is sort of how our standard American diet has veered. And so the further we can get away from that pattern of eating, the better. So what should you be eating? So every time you take a bite of food, you're really programming your biology for either health or disease. And I know that's not a realistic way to think of things, but I also tell patients that if we're thinking about that 75% of the time, we're doing well too. So the idea really is to get a lot of phytochemicals, and those are chemicals in food that give them their color, give them their flavor. They're medicinal compounds, they're embedded in plants, even in animals, and they influence chemical reactions that are constantly occurring in our bodies. And we can't naturally produce all the nutrients we need, so we've co-evolved with plants to actually be able to activate those pathways in our body. And you'll notice that blue zones incorporate a lot of these phytochemicals into their diet naturally. The other thing is, is spices are another source of um, antioxidants and phytonutrients and every culture around the world has sort of their go-to spices and I think having a mixture of all of them um, is a good idea. And then there's this idea of hormetic foods and those are foods that are grown under more stressful conditions and because of that they're able to provide a higher concentration of antioxidants and phytonutrients. And examples of those which I think one of them is Himalayan buckwheat that we'll hear more about I think in the next year or two um, resveratrol, eating products with re resveratrol, green tea is another example. And then I put uh, a slide here of the strawberries and pomegranates. So straw, you know, being thoughtful about functional foods is also uh, an easy way to think about your diet. And so strawberries are full of fisetin, which is a good senolytic. And a senolytic is an agent that gets rid of aging cells or cells that are not functioning well in our body. And then pomegranate is full of urolithin A, which is also really important to keep our mitochondria working. Protein, um, that still remains a really sticky subject and we, we won't get into it today, but bottom line is, is as we age, get older, we need more protein. Um, so it's, it's, it's very important that everyone gets the right amount. That's something that we shouldn't ignore. And then the last thing I put up on here under optimal diet is thinking about wearables. You know, our, we're going into this society that's very wearable obsessed. And one of the easiest wearables is actually a continuous glucose monitor, which is available to everyone via their insurance. May, it may not be covered, but it's available at the pharmacy. And there's a lot of other, you know, off-label continuous glucose monitors coming out on the market. But we know that elevated blood glucose over time amplifies our risk of all chronic diseases. And so a tool that can help you understand your own individual carbohydrate tolerance um, and how you respond to different foods in real time, I think is a very valuable de device, not only for your own information, but just even for behavioral modification. And we know that not all carbs are created equal. And for you as an individual, you can see how you know exercise, lack of sleep, what you're eating, what your lifestyle is like, is actually impacting your blood glucose in real time.
So behind diet and nutrition, physical activity is likely the number two factor affecting your health span. So where do we start thinking about this? And so when I think about physical activity, you know, I like to stress that we want to think about our health span goals. So performance and longevity are different goals. You may have a bucket list item of running a marathon, but what is your long-term strategy? The idea is to become an athlete for life and engage in activities that are, that are gonna preserve your functional movements and help prevent against injury. So not can you run a marathon, but can you lift your suitcase? Can you lift your child? Can you lift your grandchild? Or can you get up from sitting without pain? So in terms of exercise, what does the literature suggest? Well, it's clear that physical activity reduces the risk of dementia. And then the question becomes, how long should you exercise per week? So to simplify this slide, uh, JAMA, one of our big medical journals, did two large studies of cohorts from people from different parts of the world and found that the most beneficial effective exercise is going to come in the first two and a half hours of moderate activity with a slight benefit happening if you go up to five hours. And the other interesting thing to note is that if you engage in vigorous activity, you can actually reduce your total exercise time by 50% and receive the same benefits. So two minutes of moderate intensity activity is the same as one minute of vigorous intensity activity. And moderate versus vigorous is you know, intuitive, but brisk walking versus uphill walking, bike bicycling at less than 10 miles per hour versus doing it faster than that, water aerobics versus running or jogging. I think you get the idea. So based on the data that we just showed, maybe there's a marginal benefit in going up to five hours of exercise per week for those of you who have time. But keep in mind also that overtaxing yourself has its risks to your joints as well. And so um, there was a Harvard study done by one of the godfathers of the exercise movement many years ago, Dr. Paffenbarger, and it was published in the New, Eng New England Journal of Medicine, and he examined thousands of Harvard alumni and showed that people who exercised heavily um, lost 38% of their longevity benefit compared to those who were exercising moderately. And so I think it's important for us to think about that risk of over-exercising, and we, we know that because we see that in this phenomenon called athlete's heart. And people who are you know serious athletes, big marathon runners, they have about a seven to 10 X increase, increased risk of developing atrial fibrillation or an abnormal heart rhythm. Mechanism of action is different than someone that develops that same heart rhythm from something else. So it's important to keep in mind, but that should not deter people from exercise. The important thing is to really think about deliberate activities that can also help us overcome our everyday environment. So I think this framework really hits on all aspects of our physiology and longevity and perhaps will help you think about tactics that may work for you. So I wanted to highlight a few things. So muscle mass vanishes as you get older, and it's vital to engage in some sort of strength routine, whether it's your own body weight or using physical weights. And it's, um, it's important to remember that physical decline is a cause of mortality. So a fall that would barely bruise you at 30 could be lethal just 40 years later. Which brings me to my next point, stability, which includes flexibility and balance, definitely lacking in society today. And two big items here that are important to think about is can you hip, hin hip hinge and can you squat properly? So if you look at a two-year-old, squatting for them is innate. Like it's, it's very natural. And then we go to grade school and we start sitting for extended periods of time. And you know this cascade continues. It's like we get used to sitting at desks and sitting on our couches and sitting in our cars. So we lose a lot of our lower body strength and mobility to perform some of these simple exercises that can actually curb a lot of our older age musculoskeletal problems. And squatting is actually more stable and places less stress on your joints than this middle picture right here the way this person's bending. And it actually builds strength and it helps the biomechanics of your back, which we know over lots of wear and tear gets deranged over time. And also gives you an aerobic kick. So I won't spend too much time on the last few items, but the point is, is, it's, is it's important to toggle between your aerobic and anaerobic metabolism. So can you do short bursts of something demanding like running up the stairs with groceries? 
And this idea of how we engage in cardio, cardiovascular exercise changes at different stages in our life. So I'm trying to give really practical examples that some people may not be thinking because we don't think about how our life may change over time. So the next item in our health span toolkit and likely the most intuitive um, and easiest to buy into yet somehow continues to be very challenging is sleep. And if you think about it, we spend almost one third of our life sleeping. So if there was a way to out evolve this habit, we would have done it by now because imagine what we could accomplish if we didn't have to sleep. But there's a reason that evolution has hung on to this. And humans are probably the only species that deliberately deprive themselves of sleep. And what's really stark to me is if you start looking at the literature, there's really no aspect of your, will, your wellness that es escapes sleep deprivation. It literally leaks into every piece of your physiology. And so I've tried to pare down a few points that I thought were interesting. Oh, but one thing I wanted to say before that is there's this phenomenon that I came across in a BBC article. It, it hits, so especially among young professionals, um, is this idea of revenge bedtime procrastination. And that's where people who don't have control over their daytime hours sacrifice sleep to regain some sense of freedom during their um, evening hours. So, and, and this can be an attitude among high performers that I'll sleep when I die, but it's not an optional lifestyle luxury. It's not a debt that you can pay back later. So one of the top longevity physicians in this country who does a lot of self-experimentation told this story that when he was a resident and he averaged four to five hours of sleep for about five years, that his total testosterone by the end of his residency had dropped down to like below the fifth percentile. And then when he started averaging just two hours more, um, his numbers tripled. And that's you know an anecdotal story, but I've seen it replicated in the literature. So University of Chicago took young men in their mid-20s and limited them to just five hours of sleep for just a week, for seven days, and the drop in their testosterone levels actually aged them by about 10 to 15 years. And the same thing happens for those who suffer from sleep apnea. And women also face similar challenges. There are many links to lack of sleep and reproduction. And I bring up this idea just because I think it's a pretty stark example and you know we can naturally increase some of our hormone levels by just getting enough sleep and we all hold this you know idea of virility fertility dear to our heart so I just wanted to bring up an example that would hit home and then we've also known that there's an intimate relationship between sleep and immunity but um, what I wanted to point out is how quickly lack of sleep can really affect your immune response. So in this experiment, young healthy men were sleep restricted to four hours and for a week, and this swept away 70% of their natural killer cell activity. And these cells are very important to your immune system. So it makes sense why we're finding significant links between less sleep and the risk of cancer. And because of this, the World Health Organization has actually classified nighttime shift work as a carcinogen. So that's really eye-opening, especially to someone like me who works nights sometimes. So, And then the other link between sleep and immunity comes from this JAMA study that was done in healthy adults which found a 50% decrease in antibody response in those who received four to six hours of sleep versus seven to eight hours of sleep the week before their flu shot. So I think the takeaway point from here is that if sleep can really increase the efficacy of a vaccine by 50%, we should be focused on that, especially in a time where you know more vaccinations are coming out. So the last thing I'll say about sleep is if you remember one thing from this section, sleep is one of the most significant lifestyle factors determining your risk for Alzheimer's. So preserving your cognition really means prioritizing your sleep. So Alzheimer's is associated with a buildup of toxic proteins in our brain, and they kill off our, our neurons. And the thought is that chronic sleep disruption makes this protein buildup worse. So Actually, so our brain actually has a sewage system, though, that can get rid of this protein buildup. And that was recently discovered in 2012 at the University of Rochester called the glymphatic system, similar to our body's lymphatic system. So that system's responsible for clearing out metabolic debris that's built up during the day. So it effectively washes out those 
toxic proteins. And so the catch here is that while this system, the sanitation system, maintains a basal level of activity all the time, it really kicks in when you're in deep sleep because your, the cells in your brain can shrink to half their size and make room for your spinal fluid to come in and do this power cleanse of all the waste that's built up. And this, I always debate whether I should take this slide out, but on an anecdotal note, and this isn't based on science at all, it's curious to me that two prominent heads of state known for their deliberate sleep deprivation actually published, um, both ended up dealing with, with Alzheimer's later in life. So takeaway from this section is both the quality and the quantity of sleep are very important. And there's a handful of sleep hygiene techniques that are intuitive for us. For example, timing your caffeine il alcohol intake before bed. But one last thing that I wanted to point out is that our circadian rhythm hasn't necessarily evolved to accommodate all the blue light exposure that we're getting from artificial lighting, from our devices. And I know it's challenging to disengage from those devices a few hours before bed. But because of that, we have to find hacks around this. And blue blocking, blue light blocking glasses are a really important um, tool that everyone can use and get. And there's apps on your phone that will help screen your filter, or uh, sorry, uh, decrease the amount of blue light exposure that you're getting. And uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is snoring. Snoring is something that we don't talk about much, but it definitely affects your sleep. And so one of my favorite apps for this year is called Snore Lab, and that's something that you can use at home, and it, it functions like a sleep test, not as, not as in-depth as one you would get in the hospital, but you can track your own sleep. And then there's some really easy, quick hacks that you can do to maneuver that if you find out that you do have, um, that you are snoring through the night, and those are things like mouth tape and nose tape. So the last thing I wanted to talk about is this mental health component of health span. And this is something we often gloss over. And, you know, I want to say that um, we all experience stress, right? And some of it can be normal. And it's actually healthy to have some stress in our lives. However, stress can also be a very big toxin, and especially when it gets challenging for us to respond to in a healthy way. And so that's why I think this is a really underrated topic, but very important to talk about in medicine. And so I like to prescribe this idea of distress tolerance. And so this is basically a bank that you can build up to deal with stress, whether it's something mundane or it's life changing. And if this bank is empty, then something as simple as getting cut off in traffic is gonna create a really agitated response for you. So having some sort of practice that you engage in to help build this bank is very helpful. So I thought it would be helpful to break down or oversimplify what happens when you're engaging in a mindfulness practice or any mind-body practice for that matter. So there's two networks in our brain. One is called the default mode network and one is called the task positive network. And so the real area of interest is this default mode network. And that part of our brain is responsible for our introspective ruminating state. So basically what's called our ego. So if, for example, if you've had a bad interaction with someone and you lay in bed thinking about it, your activity in the default mode network increases. You're not focused on a specific task which is what the task positive network is for, just, just like its name says. So the idea is, is that in a healthy individual, activation of one inhibits the other. And an imbalance in this is what causes a lot of our issues like anxiety, depression, ADHD. So different techniques have been studied to reduce the power of this default mode network over your brain. And that's where mindfulness really falls in. So over even a short period of time, it can calm this overactive network and rewire your circuitry. And so this is the most natural way to calm this default network. Now what's interesting, and the, what's interesting is that the most profound and immediate way to calm the system, this default mode network, is using psychedelics. And so that's why there's so much interest um, in specifically, you know, ketamine, ketamine's been around for a long time, but psilocybin or magic mushrooms. Um, and that's currently being teased out in the psychiatric literature, but neuroimaging studies have consistently shown that psilocybin reduces this default mode network activity and basically does a reset. And this has also actually been shown medically useful in certain conditions like depression in cancer patients. So, 
I know I've talked about meditation as something that is suppressing brain activity, but it's also more complicated than that. And over time, there's actually different synapses that are being built up, which help help you with other things like spark creativity. And I love this illustration because it helps kind of visualize what I'm trying to say, but this was actually mapped from neuroimaging. So this is a picture of the brain's internal communication made pretty and nice with colors. And if you look on the, let's see, my rightmost side over here, um, you see uh, the brain's various networks happening and it, it looks cleaner, there's not a lot of traffic, but then if you look at, look at more right, all of a sudden you see all these new connections forming and it's like traffic that's been rerouted from a busy highway into all these side streets. And so it's, it's the idea is, is that your brain is creating new destinations. There's like a global interconnection of networks that we never thought possible. And we're still teasing out what that means. But that's where I think we're able to treat mental health. That's where we're able to spark creativity. And I'm not suggesting that everyone goes out and tries psychedelics now. But the point of me bringing this up is to really illustrate pharmacologically what is going on because it is fairly profound. And you can reverse engineer that same thought process to understand what the power of mindfulness or a mind-body practice can do in your life as a non-pharmacologic tool. So I actually wanted to just make a quick note. There's, it doesn't matter what you do. I always tell patients this. There's so many different mind-body practices, whether you know, you're limited by mobility. You can always find something. Tai Chi, shown in the literature, amazing mind-body practice. There's yoga, which I think is also great because it's more than just, you know, stretching and flexibility and strength building. It's actually just a road for self-improvement. And then there's breath work, which you don't need to be physically active for. And there's multiple types of breath work. And I'm just going to go back to this slide. So grounding or earthing, which is really popular in Europe, I find this concept really fascinating. But it's basically bodily contact with the Earth's natural electric charge, which stabi stabilizes a lot of our physiology on a very deep level. And there's been studies that show that this will reduce pain and inflammation and stress improve blood flow, energy, help us with our sleep. And so I think it's important to note that this is, you know, a very potent antioxidant that exists in nature. You don't have to take a supplement. All you have to do is, is stand in grass for five minutes. So there's multiple ways to engage in these kinds of practices. It's just really a matter of incorporating it into your daily life. So the last thing I'll say actually is that we all have a deep need to belong and meaning and purpose can lead to life extension. So one of your ultimate biohacks is really finding your tribe. And, you know, we talk a lot about cholesterol and blood pressure and how to, you know, eat well and exercise and all of that stuff will also help you um, live a long, healthy life. But the way we spend our time and who we spend it with is just as important, if not more. And lack of this social connection can be just as dangerous as smoking or dealing with obesity, you know, having a sedentary lifestyle. So... Keep that in mind. Mindset is also huge. A lot of our biology is determined by our beliefs. Um, there's this author that says our, bi our biography becomes our biology. And I know a lot of us struggle with our minds. So learning how to shift our minds is also, is also a really important, um, important tactic in, in longevity pathways. So I know we've covered a lot. And I, I should have put the, those six pillars up here again. But each of these topics could be a lecture in their own, and I've tried to just give you a really brief overview um, as food for thought. But perhaps the most single important thing is that each of us has to take an active role in improving and preserving our health. Um, there really isn't a drug that can rival the power that you have to control some of the variables in your life. Um, and I'll leave you with one thing today. So never discount this idea of incremental change, also known as compounding. So if there's one thing that resonated with you, start by doing that one small thing today and then try to do it again tomorrow. And I hope that you'll see the benefits um, in your life over the next five years. Thank you, that was awesome. I don't know if this is on. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. Um, that was a wonderful talk, and you covered so many different important topics that I know um, 
I found super interesting and probably everyone in here. So I just, before I look at some of these questions and you guys, please feel free to fill out any of the cards and someone will collect them and bring them up to me if you have uh, questions that you'd like me to direct to Dr. Agarwal. Um, I know there's so many different things and I think probably different parts of the conversation resonated with different people, right? Um, how do you, how would you suggest, you know, a lot of providers haven't had the type of training that you have. Um, if, if all the people in the room had interest in trying to incorporate some of these things into their lifestyle, are there like apps or websites or how should they organize their thoughts to bring them to their doctor to be like, hey, how, how can you help me with some of these, these different approaches, you know? It's, it seems like a daunting yeah. task. Yeah, no, it definitely is overwhelming. And, you know, my dream or wish would be that these are conversations that are happening all the time when you go in to visit your physician. And if they're not, and if you find them daunting, then it's helpful to find a physician who practices in more of an integrative mindset, more of a functional mindset, lifestyle mind, lifestyle medicine mindset, um, or even a health coach. Health coaches can be really helpful and, and have a lot of really nice advice to give to people. Um, there's a, a lot of good questions that are coming in. So uh, one is for the, a lot of folks, unfortunately, we give you a lot of prednisone. And so um, should there be a consideration for people that are on high dose steroids or steroids that make it really difficult to sleep? Is there anything that um, that you could suggest in terms of like trying to find ways to get better sleep while kind of having to deal with the side effects of medication that makes it hard to sleep? Yeah, so this is where this topic becomes tough because we are in a con constant tug of war between the way we're using pharmacology and the way it's influencing our life. And so I think that's gonna be something that's gonna be really hard to address up here diplomatically, to be honest. Um, so that, that, that would require a lot more than what I can say up here, different okay. hacks and strategies, and also really thinking about root cause of why someone's on high dose prednisone for the years that they're on and if they actually need to be. And we've seen patients that come in and we've made major modifications. Yeah. Um, there was one question about tracking oxygen levels. Is there any value to, to tracking your oxygen levels like while you're exercising or in general? Um, you know, a lot of our diseases affect people's lungs. And so when they're trying to exercise, is there some range that people should try to stay in or anything like that? Yeah, I think it depends on where your current oxygen level is. And there's there's going to be some wearables that are coming out in the next year or two, and actually they do exist in Europe where you can actually tra track your O2 and CO2 levels. And tracking your CO2 levels is also becoming kind of like the next way to biohack your physiology. So I think where you should be at is a tricky question because it depends on what your baseline is. Uh, but there's always value in anything you can know about your physiology and how it's responding to different environmental factors, including exercise, is always important. Um, and then in terms of cognition, right, like trying to build that up and, and get it stronger, um, does mindfulness help with any of the circuitry, like in the brain, with building cognition um, or strengthening, like your ability to process things, or what can help with that? Absolutely. Like there is nothing that mindfulness can't do to you. And it's one of those things that I think is really challenging for people to engage in, but it literally changes you on a very micro level. So you may not appreciate the change tomorrow, but if you're doing it consistently, you are going to appreciate the change over time. Um, and there's a lot of things for, for cognition. So like I said, sleep is super, super important. All the things that we talked about actually today are very important. We know that um, exercise increases your brain-derived neurotropic factor, which is basically like miracle growth for your brain. Um, there's a lot of supplements that are out there, and I'm not a big fan of just taking tons and tons of things, like taking a few things that are really good for you, but potent antioxidants. Um, we know things like go-to cola are good for your brain. So there, there are a variety of things that you can take, incorporating turmeric on a daily basis. Um, just dep it, it depends on certain people tolerate different um, supplements better. And then in, there's actually, I think it's called Brain HQ. There's, there are websites that if you want to go on and just sign up and engage your brain in different ways, like the idea is really to constantly be challenging your brain so that you can build new circuitry. So try things that are different, try things that are new, do a crossword puzzle, read every day. But there, if that's challenging for someone to do, there are websites designed where they'll actually give you activities that you could do that engage your mind in different ways. Great. And then um, 
you, you touched on it like turmeric and there's a lot of different supplements and, and you know, herbal things out on, on the market. Um, and I get the question a lot too, you know, what, what should I take? Should I take nothing? Should I take everything? Yeah. Um, are there like certain vitamins or herbal supplements like that, that are touted to boost immunity that, that you think should be avoided? Or is there any like sort of general advice you have on? Um, mm, to be avoided? So yeah. I don't, I think when it comes to taking nutraceuticals, it's, it's a great thing because it's natural, but the more, the better way to get natural things is through food. Okay, and I think what's happening these days is people are taking lots and lots of supplements. So it's all it's almost coming by taking it's, it's going back to allopathic medicine where we have like so much pharmacology sometimes in our cabinets. And I think the important thing here is to take fewer things, but take really good quality supplements and they exist. And that's why I think it's helpful to go in to a provider. And there's a lot of things that we don't think about. I think uh, one of them is when we're buying random supplements from wherever we don't know how they're stored. We don't know what's been denatured because of the heat that they're sitting in. So it's important to go to a reputable website like something like Fullscript, which we know um, is highly regulated instead of, you know, and, and Amazon does a great job, but we just, we don't have control over everything that Amazon does. You can get the same supplements, same price. It's just, you, you're getting them from a regulated spot. Um, the other thing I think to think about is the route in which you're taking some of these supplements. So, the more pills we're swallowing, you know, we don't know what fillers are and everything, what their coating is, what it's doing to your gut lining. So I think, you know, mixing it up with taking uh, something like a tincture that you can absorb through your tongue versus taking, you know, some pills, maybe making it in a powder form, maybe doing an injectable. I think it's also important to vary up how you're taking what you decide to take. And also cycling in things. Like you don't always have to take the same brand. It's good to cycle in. You may notice dif differences. And also taking breaks from certain things and adding in something else so you're not taking 20 or 30 things all the time. Thanks. And I'll just ask one last one. And everyone, the slides will be available and you'll be able to access this information. I know you guys were asking. Um, melatonin, you mentioned the importance of sleep and getting good sleep. Any thoughts on taking melatonin and how people should take it if they take it? Yeah, so melatonin also because of COVID has a lot of um, a lot of press, and I think melatonin is nice because it's also looked at as something that modulates the immune system. But the dosage of what you should take is very much a big debate, right? So if someone's in cancer remission, they may say, "Hey, take a higher dose of melatonin for the immune modulating effects." But when it comes to sleep, actually, really low doses, like even one milligram, is considered a physiologic dose for people. So I don't think it's a bad thing. I actually think that if someone's having a hard time sleeping, that's a great strategy. Now, I do think it's nice to be able to take breaks from the melatonin so you're not doing it 365 days of the year. Uh, and I wanted to mention one other thing. Oh, there, the literature suggests a few contraindications for melatonin, and one of those is Crohn's patients. And I don't think we exactly know why, but it's, it's been shown in a few studies to take them out of remission. So, and I have patients that will still do it, but it's just, it's good to be aware of that.